Okay, so uh, let me thank the organizers for giving, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. And uh, this is uh, so this talk, as Michael said, was supposed to be delivered by Gabriel, who unfortunately couldn't make it. So, uh, so the so I will be talking about uh, our attempt to stimulate the fermionic turbulence uh, using the framework of time-dependent density functional theory. So, uh, uh, well, the list of collaborators is here. Most of them actually are present in the audience, uh, including Kaurel, Michael, Kazuyuki, uh, Konrad. <coughs> uh, so, uh, should work. This way. Ah, okay. So the outline of my talk is the following. Uh, so I will first start with something very simple that you probably are aware of. So the vortex structure in spin imbalance system, because uh, one of the interesting questions that we would like to answer is what is the how the turbulence look like in the presence of spin imbalance in the uh, in the fermi in the fermi system then i uh, would like to tell you about the approach that we are using so this is time dependent density functional theory and this is the approach that we with this approach we simulate the behavior of the of the unitary fermi gas which is superfluid system and then i will show you some results that proves that uh, uh, with our method we are able to correctly reproduce the dynamics so this is uh, in particular we are able to to reproduce the solitonic cascades that were uh, <coughs> that were uh, observed experimentally and then at the end i will show you what we are trying to do concerning turbulence so i will i will show you some preliminary studies concerning vortex tangles. So let me start with the with the vortex. So as as you know very well, so in the case of in the case of bosons, so the vortex structure is rather simple. So if you have a, a condensate wave function, so the condensate wave function uh, drops to zero inside the vortex. So the, at zero temperature the, uh, in the in the bosonic system the vortex is predicted to be empty. Uh, in, the, in the case of fermions, the situation is different because then, uh, then we have an order parameter which drops to zero, but the density does not drop to zero. And actually, one can show that in the case of spin symmetric system, so there is a depletion in the density inside the vortex core. So the density behaves like R squared. Uh, inside the core. So the important feature here is that uh, inside the vortex, there are so-called Andreev states, and these, uh, and these states are very important in the case when we would like to uh, extend our studies for uh, spin imbalance system, because we'll show you in a moment how they affect the, <coughs> the structure of the vortex. So, so let's assume that we have first the spin, spin symmetric system and we have a vortex solution which is described by this, uh, uh, by this U and V components of our Bogolyubov-Degen equations. And then inside, inside, the, inside the core of the vortex, we have this Andreev states. So I plotted them in such a way that we have spin up uh, we have spin up states here, spin down states here, and this empty circles denotes the holes. So we have so we have spin down particles here and spin up holes here. Okay. Just to clarify, what's the difference between the global equation and the power equation that you can actually use to get more energy? The what power equation the spin. Well, we are using the density. Well, 
where we are using the density functional, which I will describe in a moment. <coughs> so uh, this is just uh, uh, this is just a schematic picture uh, showing what is happening in the vortex, but uh, uh, but probably it will become clear in a moment what uh, what kind of approach we are using here. <coughs> so now in the case in the case when we polarize the system, so we so we switch some of these uh, spin down particles into uh, into spin up. So that means they start to occupy these holes. So that means that what is going to happen, what is going to happen, these states here gets uh, moves here, and then we have excess of spin up particles which occupy these states. And as you can see, they have a they have a positive projection of the angular momentum. So that means that this that this excess of spin up particles here rotate in the opposite way than the rest of the vortex. So this is actually what is seen here. So we have a so in the case of spin symmetric vortex, so everything moves in one direction, but when the, but then we polarize the vortex and then inside the core the current is reversed. Current is reversed. So and this is due to the occupation of these states and uh, and this changes the structure this changes the structure of the core and also what you can see here if you plot the density there's no longer depletion in the density of spin up particles because these states occupy the center of the vortex core so there is actually the maximum of the spin up density inside the vortex core so this is the this is the difference when we move from spin symmetric to spin imbalanced system. Uh, uh, so, so these were schematic schematic plots, but we can generate the vortex using the density functional theory, and we see the same. So this is fully self-consistent approach, and the, as you can see here, this, uh, the vortex solution inside the cylinder, and then if you zoom. At the at the core of the vortex, you will see that the current inside the core moves in the opposite direction than, than outside the core of the vortex. So then the natural question appears whether this kind of effect changes the dynamics of the vortices and affects somehow the uh, the turbulent behavior that we can observe. So. Uh, so in order to tell you now what how we how we describe how we describe the system, I have to say a few words about the density functional theory because we would like to simulate the behavior of a large superfluid system. So we need to have a tool which will be able to describe the motion of of uh, several tens of thousands. Of superfluid particles. So, in order to do that, we use so called density functional theory, which is a very successful approach in the chemistry condensed matter. And uh, the idea of the density functional theory is the following. So, uh, uh, so, so, in the case, in the, in the static case, it relies on, on the so called Hohenberg Kohn theorem. So imagine that we have a uh, that we have a system of uh, of many particles. We put them in the external potential. This external potential changes the many body wave function, and this change of many body wave function induces the change of one body density. And now the Hohenberg Kohn theorem tells you that you can invert this mapping. So there is actually one to one correspondence between the density and the potential. And that means that this many body wave function is uniquely determined by the density. So that means that you do not need to use the many body wave function explicitly. And you can limit yourself to the description of the system using one body density. And this is 
huge advantage because you have then less of less degrees of freedom to to uh, to describe using uh, uh, using this approach. So practical scheme how to do that was proposed by Kohn and Sham in '65, and this is actually one of the most cited papers uh, in physics because it has uh, almost 25,000 citations. It's extremely useful in, in, uh, in chemistry, condensed matter, uh, nuclear physics as well. So this uh, hohenberg kohn theorem uh, <coughs> is useful if you would like to describe the ground state of your, of your many body system. But in our case, actually, we are not interested in the ground state. We are more interested in excited states because we would like to describe the dynamics of vortices. And in order to do that, we have to use the time-dependent density function of theory, which is a very similar, uh, similar method. So again, uh, one can show that there is a unique mapping between the external potential and a density. So that means that uh, uh, evolving the one body density, you actually, uh, you actually can uh, get information about your many body wave function. There are some additional assumptions that the continuity equation has to be uh, fulfilled. And there was a similar theorem to the hohenberg com which was uh, formulated in the 80s, so runge gross mapping, which tells you that such a one-to-one -one -one correspondence up to the phase exists between the uh, evolved one-body density and the evolved uh, many-body wave function. Uh, <coughs> so this theorem tells you that such a functional can be constructed, but it does not give you any hint how to do that. So, uh, <coughs> so this is one of the one of the difficulties in this uh, uh, in this field. So here we would like to construct the density functional that would that would uh, that would uh, uh, <coughs> describe so-called unitary Fermi gas because this is the system that we would like to study, and uh, this this led us to the formulation of the so-called superfluid local density approximation. <clears throat> so, uh, 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 so in this approach, okay. So in this approach, the energy functional is described in the uh, uh, as a function of the one-body density gradients of the density and uh, so-called kinetic energy density and the anomalous density that describe that describes the superfluid uh, superfluid system because this is the main difference between uh, uh, our system and the and the, and the molecules that we would like to describe the uh, superfluid properties so we have to include we have to include the density that corresponds to the uh, that, de that describes the superfluid properties. Uh, <clears throat> so how the so how the uh, functional looks like? So we construct our functional out of the one-body density, kinetic densities, anomalous density, and we also have to include currents. So the functional looks. Uh, looks uh, uh, like here so there is so we would like to describe spin up and spin down particles so we in principle have and the kinetic energy different coefficients that describe the effective masses for spin up and spin down components uh, so this is this is uh, uh, this is important part because this this effective masses can depend on the polarization and we have to make sure that in the case when the polarization uh, that in the limit when the polarization uh, describes so-called the polaron so one particle is surrounded by by other particle of different spin we can 
uh, we can get the uh, right results. We know also what is going to happen in the spin symmetric system. So we adjust, we adjust these coefficients to describe properly uh, uh, the effective mass dependence on the polarization. So the other term is this term, which describes the normal interaction energy, which has to scale like uh, the density to the, to the five thirds, because this is the dependence on the density of the Fermi gas. And then it's also depend on the polarization. And we have to make sure that it gives the proper scaling. So, it, uh, <coughs> so the energy, so the energy of the, of the unitary Fermi gas uh, is uh, 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 equal to the at zero temperature is equal to psi, which is 0.37 times energy of non interacting fermions. And then we have the term which describes the superfluid properties, which is uh, made of this anomalous density term and the coupling constant, which also. Uh, which also is basically depends on the polarization, and this has to be adjusted in such a way that the ratio of the gap of the pairing gap to the Fermi energy is about 0.5, like it is in the unitary Fermi. Then, because we use this effective masses here, we have to correct for the restoration of Galilean invariance, and then this is why we have to include these terms, which depends on the currents and uh, they depend on this effective masses. So as you can see, the effective mass is exactly equal to one. These two terms vanishes. They are non-zero only if alphas are not equal to one, because then you have to restore uh, Galilean invariance using these current terms. So this is the functional that we use to describe our system, which is the unitary Fermius. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and this functional contains few parameters to be precise six, and they uh, have to be adjusted to ab initial calculations. So this, uh, these are Monte Carlo calculations for various numbers of spin up and spin down particles put in the harmonic traps. And then uh, these uh, coefficients are adjusted to minimize to minimize the errors between the ab initial calculations and this density functional results. So, in order to uh, describe the dynamics, so we uh, use the density functional. We use the density functional to construct the evolution of the uh, of this u and v components that describes the evolution of various densities in our function. And this equation looks like the well-known uh, artifact Bogolyubov or Bogolyubov de Jeune equation, but there is uh, the difference is that here this h term, this uh, this h term contains is more complicated and it's really adjusted to describe properly the properties of the unitary Fermi gas. So, <clears throat> so these equations are uh, not easy to solve because there's a huge number of these equations. So uh, in practice, uh, we have to solve of the order of hundreds of thousand up to million of this equation. So this is not the problem that you can solve on the laptop. So we have to use supercomputers to do, to do this. So we are using various supercomputers, including Summit, which is the most powerful supercomputer. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what we can do with our approach, so we can, uh, <clears throat> uh, we can, uh, describe our, uh, we can evolve our system on the spatial mesh, which we can, at the moment, the limit 
for the size of this lattice is 100 cube. So, <clears throat> so we have a fully unconstrained 3D dynamics on this lattice. So there is no any no symmetry uh, restrictions concerning how the system can evolve. The maximum number of particles uh, that we can uh, that we can evolve at the moment is of the order of 10,000. And we can evolve the system for about a million time steps. Uh, so we can evolve, uh, so we can evolve this equation for about a million time steps, which we can translate it to the times characteristic for the uh, experiments with the unitary frame gas. It leads uh, to the time scales of a few milliseconds. Uh, okay, so uh, now let me show you what we can achieve with this approach. So the uh, so the first, well not first, but one of the important tests for this approach is to describe the experiment which was reported in the series of papers. So in this experiment, the cloud of uh, uh, of fermionic atoms was split into two. Then the phase of one part of the cloud was changed, and then these two, uh, and then these two clouds were merged again. So then, due to this uh, phase difference, there was uh, observed the uh, was observed that the dark soliton has been uh, has been created, and then this uh, dark soliton subsequently decayed and there was a, a the sequence of decay you can see here so it was a dark solid on first then it evolved into something which was identified by as a so-called phi solid on and then uh, it turned to, to it, it decays subsequently into vortex ring and then at the end we have a single vortex line so uh, this sequence of uh, uh, solitonic cascade we couldn't reproduce using gross IHT uh, method or any modification of the gross IHT method. And in this uh, and in our approach, actually we could see all the stages that were observed experimentally. So we so we started from the dark soliton. We really saw the phi soliton that was constructed, that was that appeared later, then vortex ring, and then at the end vortex line. Okay, so that was, uh, in our opinion, a remarkable agreement uh, between the theory and uh, the experiment that all the stages of the solitonic cascade were reproduced. So let me show you how the okay so this is uh, just the movie showing the uh, stages of the cascade so you can see here the phi soliton that it evolves into vortex ring and then at the end you have a single vortex line so that gives us confidence that we have a proper dynamics of our of our uh, solitonic excitations and our and our vortices which is crucial if we would like to describe uh, the turbulent behavior so interesting thing this is something that was not measured experimentally but we can do the same in the case of the polarized system in the case of polarized system so we have a different number of spin up and spin down fermions. And we again have two clouds uh, of atoms that differ with the phase, and then we merge them. And then what is going to happen after some time, as you can see, so this is, so, th so these colors denote the, the polarization. So then you see here the vortex that appear, and inside the vortex, as you can see, the polarization is enhanced. 
So the system is unpolarized, it's superfluid around, and inside the vortex, the excess of polarization occurs. So this is exactly what I showed you at the very beginning concerning the change of the structure of the vortex due to the, uh, due to the polarization. Okay, and we observed also that the, depending on the degree of spin polarization, we see the different, we see the difference in the solitonic cascades. So, for example, if the polarization is less than 20%, then we observe this cascade that was seen experimentally. So the dark soliton converted into vortex ring and then end up with a vortex line. But when we increase the polarization, then some stages of this cascade are not present. So for example, for the polarizations of the order of 40%, everything stops at the vortex ring, which, is, which, which does not decay. And uh, if we increase the polarization even farther, then dark soliton is stable, so it does not decay. It is eventually expelled from the system, but it does not split it does not decay into vortex ring or vortex lines. So this is the interesting feature showing <coughs> that there is a difference in the dynamics of the vortices and the uh, uh, solitonic excitations in general, depending on the degree of polarization in the system. <coughs> So the, the, the fact that the dark soliton actually is stable for larger uh, <coughs> polarization was, was, uh, was predicted using simplified models even earlier. So then it's kind of confirmation of, of, the, uh, of the prediction of the prediction supported area. <coughs> another, another feature uh, related to the polarization is uh, which has uh, important consequences for the turbulence as we as we expect is the fact that somehow what we noticed is that increasing the polarization the vortices are not so uh, uh, do not do not want to reconnect so uh, so frequently as in the case as in the case of spin symmetric system so this is uh, so this is uh, so for example when we when we take two clouds and we uh, two atomic clouds with the phase difference zero pi we collide them and we eventually uh, create two vortices in the case of spin symmetric system these two vortices they reconnect as you can see here Whereas in we, when we increase the polarization, uh, as you can see, they don't want to reconnect. They uh, form a vortex ring, and that's it. So this is we do not see we do not see the same dynamics uh, if we increase the polarization. So we expect that this is due to these changes in the core of the vortex that I showed you at the beginning. And uh, this is just the consequence of uh, that fact. <clears throat> so these changes uh, of these changes of polarization may uh, affect also other uh, properties of vortices, like, uh, for example, the, uh, the properties of Kelvin waves, and uh, uh, and what I just show you the vortex vortex interaction so it leads to a different it would lead to a different rate of the connection okay so now uh, i would like to show you some preliminary results concerning our attempts to describe the to describe the vortex tangle using this approach so then uh, one important aspect here is that we have to, we have to uh, find a way to create the complicated vortex tangle, which is not easy in the case of fermionic system. 
So we decided to do the, to do the following thing. So we first create the uh, lattice of vortices. Then we cut the system using external potential. And then we change the phase of, uh, uh, <clears throat> then we change the phase of, uh, of, such a, uh, of such a subsystem. And then we merge them again. So there is a phase difference between this part and this part and then this part. And then we remove this potential. And that, as you can see in a moment, it creates, it, it can create a very complicated uh, vortex tangle. So this is also, uh, this, the figures show you how this, how the vortex lattice changes <coughs> when we increase the spin polarization in the system. So as you can, uh, so what is plotted here is the, uh, is the pairing, is the pairing gap. Uh, and uh, here is unpolarized spin symmetric system. Then we increase, then we increase the polarization so you can see, first of all, that the sizes of the vortex core expand, and then also there is there are some changes in the in the uh, 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 changes in the in the lattice uh, of the of the vortices as we increase the polarization. So here, this this part this part show you uh, show you the distribution of polarization. So the so the blue color describes the unpolarized uh, unpolarized region and there is the in, and there is the increase of polarization inside the cores so the polarization is sucked sucked into the core of the vortices okay so <clears throat> okay so now i will show you the simulations uh, so uh, uh, so this is the lattice then uh, as I described, I cut it uh, using the external potential. I changed, I changed the phase of the pairing field in these regions. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you will see what is going to happen. The same, uh, the same schematic plot of vortex lines is shown here. So this corresponds exactly to the, uh, to the lattice here. Here, what you can see is integrated density. So we cut the system with a perpendicular plane, and we, what is shown here is the integrated density. Uh, and on this plot, this is the logarithmic. Uh, this is the logarithm of the total length of vortices divided by the length of vortices uh, at at the at the beginning, so at the time equal to zero. So you can see here how the length of vortices is going to change as a function of time. Okay, so let me start. So now you can see this uh, subsystem merge. So then the solitonic excitations are uh, uh, created and then you can see the complex vortex tangle, uh, and then uh, yes, and then maybe I will, I, will, I will show it again because okay, okay. So once again, because uh, please have a look at this plot here. So this shows how the length of the vortices changes. This is the important. This is the important point which we would like actually to understand. So uh, so once again. We create we create this uh, solitons, so the length of the vortices increases rapidly, and then it starts to decay. Okay, so then it starts to decay, and then we have, and then we have uh, 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 one uh, interval when the rate of decay is uh, uh, is uh, more rapid, and then it slows down. And there is another, so there is something happening here. So there is a change of the slope of the, of the decay rate. So the change of the slope uh, in which the uh, length of the vortices is decreasing. 
What are the slopes of the two lines? Mm -hmm. What are the slopes? Oh, these are uh, so these are just fitted. To, so these are straight lines fitted to what we see. Right, right. This is the. But what is the slope? One over time in this. Oh, so uh, uh, so you, so so you see here it's e to the is uh, so it's minus zero point three and here is minus zero point eleven. This is what. So what we see here is the. The uh, so we uh, so in our so in our evolution of the system, so we can distinguish so we can distinguish two uh, uh, <coughs> two stages. So in the first stage, the uh, this this, uh, this the slope is larger. So the so the decrease of the length of the vortices. Is uh, is decreasing faster, and then in the in the in the second stage, it's slowed down actually, and uh, so the interesting questions uh, is what is the what actually is happening here, and why this slope why this slope change changes its 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 character. So here you have three curves for different polarization, different spin polarization of the system. So as you can see, in the first stage, uh, the slopes are not dependent so much on the polarization. Uh, so now I will show you the same behavior of the vortices. So it's the same simulation as I showed you before, but indicating the points where the reconnection uh, has occurred, so these reconnections will be show will be shown using uh, red uh, red circles. So, uh, like, so as you can see at the beginning, there is uh, there are these reconnections are localized uh, at the at the location where this solitonic excitation has been created, and then the now, then the rate of the reconnections decreases, and they are now distributed more uniformly all around the system. And so they now they are less and less, less and less frequent. <laughs> Okay, so if we plot, if we plot the, uh, if we plot the reconnections, the position when the reconnections occur as a function of time, and here is the plot showing the length, the total length of the vortices as a function of time. So you can see that the first stage, which we call the generation, which uh, so this is the this is the. Uh, Time interval in which the length of the vortices is, is increasing due uh, due to the fact that the solitonic excitations uh, decay and pump the energy into the into the decrease of freedom related to the vortices. So they are localized here, and then and then the reconnections later are more uniformly distributed all around the system. And also, and also another feature is that the vortices gets uh, uh, aligned along the z-axis. So this is this is the uh, this is the integrated uh, tang uh, z uh, z component of the tangent vector associated with each vortex at each point. And this is integrated. So if if this if this uh, uh, increases, it shows that the vortices 
that the vortices are trying are are uh, uh, trying to be aligned along z axis. So there's also some change of slope between this stage here and this stage here. So there is a there's a there's a faster alignment in this region and a slower alignment in this region. What we also measured, this is very preliminary and very recent. Uh, we measured the number of vortices that were created. So the number of vortices, so uh, let's focus on the on the red line, which corresponds to the spin symmetric system. So this is number of vortices uh, uh, that is present in the system at each time. So again, you can see that it reaches the maximum. Uh, uh, where the length of the vortices is maximum, and then it decays, and then the number of vortices stays more or less constant. Okay, so these are, uh, so I'm not giving you any very definite answers here, so, so these are preliminary results, it's just, it just showing you uh, how rich behavior of the <coughs> vortex tangle we can simulate in our approach. And there is, uh, 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 <coughs> and there are some interesting feature which we would like to understand, uh, to understand better. Okay, so, uh, uh, <coughs> so the conclusions, so using this time dependent DFT, so we are able, so we are able to address this uh, problem of microscopic simulations of the turbulence in the fermionic system. So I think this is important that we can try to understand what is the difference between the behavior of the, uh, of the vortices, the vortex tangles in the bosonic and in the fermionic system using this time-dependent DFT approach, which proved to be quite accurate uh, in the description of the superstring properties of the unitary Fermi gas. Also, we can uh, explore here completely new degree of freedom. That means we can see what is going to happen if we move from the spin symmetric system to the uh, spin imbalance system and how it affects how it affects the dynamics of vortices. So, uh, uh, so this is so these are studies that we are uh, that we are currently uh, that we are uh, we are currently conducting, and uh, hopefully soon we'll have some new interesting uh, results to report. So I think I will finish here. Unless Gabriel would like to add something to this. No, no. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, inside of the vortex course, are the spins oriented along the circulation direction or opposite? Are they so are the spins polarized in the same direction as the circulation vector within the water course? Well, they rotate in the opposite direction. So, so, so the angular, so the so the so the angular momentum. So the so the so the spin extent, the spin ex, the, the spins are elongated along the vortex, but they but their angular momentum, they are rotating in the opposite direction. I mean, it's the two spin components. Yes. So so. So this is, is one vortex with, let's say the vortexes uh, circulation is open up. Is the vortex core filled with only one type of, one, one of the spin components? Yeah, the majority yeah. is spin up components, yeah. Yes, yeah. so if the circulation is up, yeah. then it's spin up. But it doesn't matter if the spin is. 
So you should spin up and spin down, get a spin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So spin up and spin down have nothing to do with the angular momentum. Yeah, yeah. So you can just two species. You can think like about two species. So it's it does not. Yeah, it 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 need not to be spin. Yeah, yeah. But spin up and spin down. One there's only one one species within the vortex core, and that depends on whether the actual superfluid circulation around the vortex core is up or down. No. It no. just depends which one you have it's more of. Yeah. Which one has more of the, the excess. You need both components, yeah. Yeah. You need both components to have the okay. So you need yeah. to one. <laughs> I kind of like this world that actually many years ago I, I read the paper of the similar things with the soft superfluids. Of course, we work with different fluid fabric. What I'd like to ask you is that. Uh, so this is something like a, an efficient quantum field theory, not fully flexed quantum field theory. I think it's just uh, basically, uh, it, uh, it looks to me like it is an efficient way of calculating multibody effects. But uh, my question is, is this, is this approach equivalent to thermal density matrix? Is your to... thermal density matrix? No, I don't think so. Uh, it's everything here is at zero temperature, so it, thermal density. Thermal. The temperature, you don't have any normal component. No, I mean uh, we have a normal component in the sense that we have spin imbalance system. So we have a, so we have a, uh, so we can we can have a partly uh, system in which the pairing gap is small or going to zero. So we have, so in that sense, we have a normal component. But all these simulations are at zero temperature. So it's HFB, but yeah. the occupancies are not thermal. They're yeah. it's one or zero. So the so there is normal component only from the vortex core. But the P equals zero. The P equals zero. There is normal component yeah. from the vortex core. So in these fermionic theories, if you stir them up, you can lose superfluidities. You lose the pairing. Okay, okay. so uh, well, let's lay the Well, but it's not no, thermal. No, 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 no. All the temperature is internal in the degrees of freedom here. Not a thermal. Okay, so uh, uh, so we have a density. So we have a density inside the inside the inside the core of the vortex, and the pairing gap is going to zero here. So you have a so you can say you have a normal component here. So in that sense, you have a normal component here. Right. This, this is an interesting and unresolved question of how do you relate this to yeah. the thermal version? Yeah, yeah, right, but there are more I think you cannot, you cannot, on the microscopic level, you right, cannot disentangle, the disentangle <laughs> normal <laughs> and superfluid <laughs> component. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I okay. Okay. Uh, you can create the uh, uh, Kelvin uh, modes actually in this situation when you have a spin. Uh, uh, this is something that we are planning to do actually. So, uh, yeah, we didn't do that. This is something we are. Uh, this is one plot that I. Uh, yeah, we didn't do that uh, yet. Okay. But this is the. Uh, yeah, so actually, let me. Uh, oh, yeah, so. Uh, um, I mean, so. <laughs> So we are uh, so we are currently trying to you know so we are currently trying to generate various uh, excitations in the in the in the vortex lattice. The funny thing here is that if you do the same thing with the with bosonic lattice and you use gross pitaevsky it immediately became into very complex. Uh, vortex tangle here somehow this in the fermionic in the fermionic system these vortices are more stiff they do not they are not so uh, susceptible to uh, to the external potential trying to twist them and, uh, and that, uh, from both sides of the screen let me ask you two simple questions just the commission is the problem uh, you presented a very powerful, complicated uh, simulation with a lot of results. Do you remember from your talk in one or two sentences? <laughs> 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 
Very on the board, 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 board,